Hi, I'm Dr. Jamil Sayaj. And on this podcast, we're going to talk about some deep stuff. I'm here to tell you that you're amazing. And often, the only person who can't see that is you. No matter who you are, what you do, or where you're from, there's greatness in you. Let's talk about it. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Jamil Sayaj, life, business, and relationship coach, and welcome to the Transformation Starts Today podcast, where I interview leaders, champions, and high performers from all walks of life as they share their stories, the lessons they've learned along the way, and empowering perspectives to help you create an extraordinary life without regret starting today. Today, we have a true financial wizard with us, an amazing human being with a big heart and a desire to serve, my friend, Andrew Romano. Andrew is a financial advisor and coach based in the financial district of New York City with a practice that spans over 100 clients over 25 states. He's also a published children's author, co-authoring the most well-traveled squirrel in the whole wide world. And he's a professional voice actor, including trailers, promos, narrations, and now audiobooks. Andrew is passionate about working with children, particularly with mustard seed communities. They run orphanages in Jamaica, Nicaragua, the Dominican Republic, Zimbabwe, and Malawi. He enjoys traveling and he wants to visit a new country each December to experience the Christmas season in different places. Andrew, it's truly a pleasure to have you with us. Welcome to the show. Jamil, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's an honor. Thank you. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. I'm well caffeinated and, and well fed. So I'm and it's sunny out. So I'm I'm in good shape. Yeah, it's finally starting to get a little bit warm in New York. Yes. <laughs> it's good. It took, took, took long enough. <laughs> so I'm curious, what country do you have on your sites for this December? Oh man, I know I put that out there as a goal and I still haven't decided what I want to do for this year. Well, this year will have to be put on hold actually, because my family and I, I'm one of six kids and have a lot of nieces and nephews now, all of us, I think it's about 18 people in total, will be doing a family vacation to Disney in early December. So we will be going to the Epcot International Plaza. So we will be visiting 12 different countries around that lake that they have there. But maybe next year, looking at either Paris or maybe Nuremberg or potentially Novi Sad in Serbia, you know, a couple of different European type cities, maybe Amsterdam, maybe mm-hmm. somewhere in Denmark, a lot of, lot of different options. So haven't decided yet. That sounds really exciting. But this year we have the most ha- the happiest place on earth. That's where you're headed. <laughs> we'll, see. we'll see if it's still the happiest by the time we're, we're done with all that family closeness. <laughs> hey, uh, <laughs> is there a place or two that stands out in your mind that you visited in the past around December time that was just r- remarkable that you'd recommend? Artists? No, not yet. And the, the reason for this goal is there the, P- the travel guy on PBS, his name is Rick Steves, and he has this European Christmas special. And it's one of the, it's about 45 minutes long, but it's one of those things that I watch around Christmas time every year because he visit it, visits about eight different European countries and just shows you how they celebrate it. So that inspired me to want to go experience sort of the anticipation of the season with all the hustle and bustle and the, the cool street decorations and the, the bustling pubs and all that kind of, of like festivity. Um, so haven't yet been anywhere in December, but that's the, a new, new target for me. That's awesome. And it definitely creates a, well, when I, when I heard that, when I read it, I was just like, wow, um, like I've told you, you know, traveling is something that I finally got in, uh, I'm getting to do more, but in the past, always wanted to travel, didn't really choose it. Now just making time for it. And it's so wonderful to hear that you've got that goal for yourself. It sounds really wonderful. Yeah. And so before we move forward, after just reading your bio, I think it would be, it would be criminal of me not to ask you, what is the most well-traveled squirrel in the whole wide world all about? <laughs> yeah. So in the book, our hero, Tommy gets to New York city by way of the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. So he falls asleep in the tree, it's chopped down, it's brought in and at the tree lighting, all the lights go off. And with, as we say in the book, all the hullabaloo that he finds himself in a uncharted territory. And the whole point of the series will be that he'll travel all around the world, teaching kids that there's all these wonderful foods, languages, religions, and cultures to go out and explore it all. And we hope to inspire you know, kindergarten through third graders with this, but also maybe uh, pull at the heartstrings of, of the, the child in each one of us and remind 
some adults of how they were once that way when they were a kid. Like when we're that age and we see someone who doesn't quite look like us or talk like us or eat like us, it's, oh, what, what are you doing? Why do you, why are you wearing that? What are you eating? And it's this point, it's from a place of curiosity versus as we get into society, it sort of grounds that out from us. And it's, what are you doing? Why, why do you dress like that? What are you eating? And it's more of a almost a borderline xenophobic or rather than just staying in this curious state. And fortunately I've remained in more of that curious disposition in my life. So trying to kind of reinsert that in a lot of people's lives. I love that. If, if people want to get a copy of that book, is where, where could they find that? I believe right now, it, so at some point, will be available on Amazon. But as of now, it's welltraveledsquirrel.com. There you go. Perfect. Yeah. And so for my listeners who don't know you and they haven't heard your story, how do you come to be doing what you're doing right now? And what are some of the challenges maybe you faced along the way and some of the lessons that you took from those experiences? Yeah, so I, there's three things I'm doing, you know, in my my professional pursuit right now. Two on the more creative side, one on the more we'll call it more analytic side, but as you know, it's more on the the coaching side. And I align myself more with a professional like you than I do any other financial advisor that is out there. The financial advisor side, I'll start there. That's that that's how I spend most of my time. That's a lot of my life's work in in how I now do that work. You know, he was born more of, you know, I, gra I graduated with, you know, majors in both finance and computer science. And so I had a, a pulling toward some of the more mental aspects of finance. I just liked that, those studies in business, but I never really felt much energized by doing anything in a corporate way. And I was in a five-year leadership development program at Citigroup. And in that program, we were you know, bounced around to all different areas, had mentors for bosses. Some of us were rotated globally around the world. And, you know, it was, it was interesting. So I was combining a lot of my technology knowledge with my financial knowledge in, in those roles. But what was funny is I started to become the guy on the floor that all of the executives would talk to about their 401k, whereas they would have access to the free actual licensed financial advisor and people seemed to prefer to talk with me about it. I was a nerd and really got into the underpinnings of the plan and researched it for myself. And then I found that I was just naturally, you know, I had a natural talent for just sitting with people and talking with them about that. So eventually I, you know, transitioned in 2008, picked a wonderful time to get into <laughs> that work. Uh, but in hindsight, it was a wonderful blessing. I, I went into Merrill Lynch's training program and, uh, you know, within a, uh, with less than a year, about nine months, I was laid off because with all that turmoil, they couldn't keep on the new advisors that had a salary, but no book of business yet. But it taught me a core lesson that really took me about the last decade to really iron out to be able to voice well, which was that I just saw in the industry that there was not much coaching going on with clients, that the, the financial advisors, we were taught on how to talk about the investments but not on how to coach the individual because it's one thing to know how to set up a really well diversified engineered academically sound investment portfolio it's a whole other thing to really coach the client the investor on how to own that kind of portfolio it takes a lot of patience and discipline to stick with that over the long haul and it's one of those things that people know academically but unless you're handling the emotional aspects of what it feels like to own a risk-based kind of investment that's going to fluctuate up and down. And sometimes it's up and you get over exuberant and sometimes it's down and you panic and sometimes it's choppy and up and down and up and down. And so you start to get nervous that it's wasting time. And so I've learned over the last, especially over the last decade on how to more coach people into that. And then on the, the shorter side with the writing, I've always enjoyed writing when I was nine. I asked Santa for two things, a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle action figure and a typewriter. So yes, I'm old enough to- Only the necessities of life. You know? Yes. <laughs> and on Christmas day, I broke my action figure because its limbs did not bend and I tried to get them to bend and they did not. Uh, but I used to then sit at my parents' dining room table, plug in that typewriter. And I just loved the idea of taking a blank page and- I can put anything on this. And I enjoyed just the creation aspects of writing, but I also was a little OCD when I was a child, Not, nothing clinical, but a little bit. So I liked the sort of completion aspects of rhyming. 
And so I just enjoyed writing all different kinds of little poems and little short stories and, you know, just creating. And then the opportunity arose with my friend Blaze when she had the idea for the squirrel book to then, you know, start writing that with her. And I've got lots of other ideas bubbling up uh, that I, I'll be working on in the next couple of years, but it certainly provides a wonderful creative outlet. But it's funny how it works in with my day-to-day -day work as an advisor, because I what I pride myself on is taking really complicated topics and simplifying them down so that even really smart people, maybe for the first time in their lives, can truly understand a particular financial topic, whether that be something with investments, insurance, or cash flow, or debt management. I try to get really good at, well, hey, how can I deliver this to a five-year-old? Because that's my audience with the children's books. And so maybe that will also lead me to developing some, some children's books for around money and all that stuff. Cause you know, no one teaches us those things. And then the, the voiceovers is just kind of funny. I've, you know, just when I was in college, I used to watch the, the TV show 24 mm -hmm. with some friends. And for anyone listening, who's unfamiliar, it's a, about a counterterrorism agent uh, called Jack Bauer uh, played by Kiefer Sutherland, but the entire season is 24 episodes long and each episode is one hour of a day. So the entire uh, series, the entire season is a single day. So it's a very intense kind of show. And I just w enjoyed watching that show that his character never had a downbeat. Everything was so intense. And I used to just mimic back his character because I just found it funny. And I learned that I could do that with my voice. And so I just started doing that as a party trick. And so it was just something funny to do. But then one, you know, one thing I learned early on in life is people can't read your mind. So what I started to do when I was still working at Citigroup and not yet living out my, the work that I'm doing now in a much more purposeful way, I, when we were out in those you know, mid twenties and you were networking and talking about people like, what are you doing and what do you do for a living? I would say, yeah, you know, I'm in this program at Citigroup, but I also want to write children's books one day and I want to get into voice acting because I, I realized, well, one, me saying this to enough people would kick my butt into action because I'd be creating a sort of uh, a uh, shame-based accountability system because I would feel pretty shameful if I saw someone three to six months later at a party, it's like, oh yeah, how's the writing going? Or how's the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the auditions? And if I kept showing up saying, well, no, I haven't done anything in those, <laughs> in those cool areas. So I actually wanted to make sure I had progress there so I could actually, because people were then curious and it was inspiring to people because most in their twenties are just grinding out in some more corporate job. So it was that aspect. Plus, hey, I learned the more you talk about what you're trying to be up to, you give at least some percentage chance that someone you mentioned that to can actually help you in some way. Versus if you just keep that all up in your head, no one's going to be able to help you. Mm -hmm. And so specifically with the voiceovers, I was sitting with a, a friend who was a bartender many years ago. And I mentioned that to her because I just got really good at saying that to anyone who asked like, hey, what, what am I working on now? And she told me she had a friend that was needing a voice actor for a few radio commercials for Toll Brothers. And, but they didn't have a budget for a voice actor. Would I be willing to do that? And I said, heck yes. And so my first foray into that world was actually recording three radio commercials that went out on air. And I just remember walking back on my like 53rd and Fifth Avenue on a really sunny day, like today, just feeling amazing. I was energized. I took direction well in the booth. And so I said, okay, I have to add this to my pursuits and it's just one of those things in life where the, the more you seem to take on, the more capacity you seem to have to take on things. Mm, I love that. Thank you for sharing. And something that you just said towards the end that I want to stress for the audience or this idea of, I, I tell my clients often there's three types of accountability. The first type of accountability is your personal accountability. So it's like, I said I would do something and I'm keeping my word to myself. That can be very successful. And for some people, it doesn't work so well. Then there's the second type of accountability, which is more coach accountability. And the third is what you alluded to, which is peer accountability. And when you start spreading your message far and wide, this is what I'm up to. This is what I'm working on. You can count on it. I'll have it done by that day. There's this like kind of mechanism that kicks in. I don't want to look bad in front of everybody. I don't want everyone to think, oh, that guy, that girl can't keep their word. So you do it. And so it's amazing that I, I gave a talk a couple of years ago and I shared these three. And I just, 
as a fun example, I just said, imagine you posted on your Facebook wall and you said, hey, everybody, this is what I'm working on. And my commitment is if you don't see a post from me by next Friday at 2 p.m. saying it's done, everyone who comments in this post, I'm buying you lunch. And that was like, I, I said it as a joke. Some guy did that. And so he did it later that day. And a week goes by and he wasn't going to get it done. And he eventually acted on it and he did it because he goes, I really don't want to have to buy a hundred people lunch right now. And then it gets done and you move things forward. So it's a really useful way and uh, of getting things done. And the first thing that you commented on that I wanted to speak to, he said around 2008, you kind of, you got into this next chapter of your life. And he said, wonderful time to get in, you know? And it's this idea that so often he said it was a blessing. It, it worked out to be a blessing. We look back, Steve Jobs has that quote, you can't connect the dots looking forward, but you can looking backwards. And so right now, maybe you're getting into something and it feels like it's a challenging time to begin, but you know the time's gonna pass anyway. And if it matters to you and it's important to you, throw yourself into it fully, figure it out as well as you can, because months from now, years from now, decades from now, you look back and you realize, like Andrew said, there were blessings in disguise. There were a lot of moments that if they didn't happen the way they did, you wouldn't have the success you do now in the future, you know? And so yeah, that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, one, so one of my favorite quotes is from a female mystic and I'm trying to remember her name and I, it's, it's escaping me, but she had said, first there is the fall, then there's the recovery from the fall. Both are the grace of God. So for me and for maybe a more modern example, Mr. Rogers, when he was growing up, and he'd be watching the, the, the TV and seeing, say, a fire, his mom would tell him to look for the helpers. There's always helpers. So for me, I try to be a student of reframing. I try to be a student of sort of seeking out the grace in any given moment, knowing that even in our toughest moments, when things seem to be all the chips stacked against us, that there is grace to be found there and that there is something that we can take from that. And so I try to, knowing that it's not necessarily a positive experience I'm going through per se, but that then I can draw upon that to be coming out ahead when all is said and done. Yeah. The thing that comes up when you say that some people who hear what Andrew just said might hear it and think, well, it kind of sounds like positive thinking, right? And when I hear something like that, I like to reframe it as it's not a matter of trying to be positive. For me, I think of it as what's useful, what actually serves you to get where you want to be. And notice that with this perspective that Andrew just shared with us, in a way, it makes you unbeatable. Because when you are in that down moment, but you're looking around going, where's the helpers? Where's the gift here? What's the blessing here? How, what am I going to learn from this? How is this actually going to make me a better version of me? Even if I can't see it right now, even if it feels like, you know, like the ceiling's coming down on me, that somehow this is gonna benefit me in the long run. If we just chose to believe that and we lived as if it was true, all of a sudden you find what you're looking for. So you start to notice the helpers, you notice the blessings, you notice how you get stronger and the lessons and all these kind of things. And you end up more than likely getting where you wanna be that you may not have if you didn't have that perspective. So rather than, is it true, is it not true? Is it, is it useful? Does it actually serve you? Yeah, yeah, it's, especially with when COVID started, I learn that there are two types of people and I'm a huge fan of dichotomies like the this or that the from the the highlights days when I was a kid goofus and gallant but I learned that there were two types of people opportunity people and obstacle people obstacle people when an obstacle comes up in their life you know they get fired a, a, a loved one dies uh, you know a pandemic hits the obstacle comes into their world and all they can seem to see is the obstacle and it clouds up their entire space and it takes everything up in their, in their world. Whereas opportunity people tend to see the obstacle, see the opportunities that exist in spite of that obstacle and sometimes see the new ones that exist because of the obstacle that's now in there. So for example, with the pandemic, I saw that as an opportunity to get into a lot better shape because without needing to be traipsing myself all around New York City for my client meetings, I had hours more a day. So I went from you know maybe walking six, 7,000 steps a day to 15 to 20,000 steps a day and just got a lot healthier because I was able to take advantage of the obstacle called a global pandemic, but see what opportunities still exist now for me, knowing that it is changing up 
how I have to do a lot of things. Yeah. Given your expertise, your line of work, you know, for so many people, money is a very emotionally charged subject, yeah, as, as I know you know. And so for you, you know, what is money to you? How do you relate to it? Yeah, you know, lots of different ways. But one simple example is you can think of having three buckets in life, time, talent, and treasure. And at any given moment, those buckets are filled up in different ways. As a general rule, and I love the Mark Twain quote, all generalizations are false, including this one. So generalizations being what they are. When we're younger, we might have a lot of time. We might not yet have a ton of talent, and we certainly don't yet have much treasure around. But we can donate our time. We can volunteer. We can do things with our time that others may not be able to because we don't yet have certain family obligations, job obligations, and or medical obligations because we're young and health, healthy and energetic. And then as we get into mid-career life, maybe we have a little bit less of the time, a little bit more of the talent, and a little bit more of the money. So maybe we need to pick and choose and, and give from a bit of all three. And then maybe as we move into our later years, maybe the, the time starts to come back up because maybe we're now retired. The talent is there. And whether the treasure is there or not, it's more just being able to look at, all right, where am I at in life and what can I give? And for me, that is so critical. I am constantly thinking of with all three, how can I, just like that movie, The Yes Man with Jim Carrey, you know, I'm constantly saying yes and all right, I'll figure out what, what it means after I've just said yes to a thing. Mm -hmm. And what I found in life is that that leads to a lot more opportunities than it does obstacles. As a quick tangent, that's how I am now got into recording audiobooks. Uh, the author whom I know personally, mentioned the book to me and asked me to do it. And I knew it would be a large commitment because recording an audio book, when you have a full-time other job and lots of other things going on, I, without even hesitation, I said, yes, I'll figure it out. And it's wonderful that we, and we had that upfront commitment conversation of the timing that would be required. Cause I would certainly take longer to produce that for her than someone who is doing that full-time. But I just find that it leads to just so many wonderful opportunities. So with money, you know, people have this odd relationship with money in part because my, my gen general, general belief is that it lives in language and none of us are taught on how, the language of money. Most of us are brought up to not talk about three things at the dinner table, usually politics, religion, and money. And nearly all wor world wars are fought over what? Politics, religion, and money. So part of my theory, and it's just an Andrew Romano theory, there's, I don't think there's much science yet on this front, is that if we just taught people how to talk more effectively about all of those things, but in my work, especially around money, it would temper a lot of the other issues. I've learned that money is never the issue. People point to that because they have nowhere else to point, but money is never the issue. It's more that it just magnifies any issue that exists. So it's not about, you know, money in and of itself being the thing that, you know, a couple, let's say, might fight over. It's this, you have one spouse who was never taught how to talk about money, another spouse who was never taught how to talk about money. They're talking about something that involves money because just about everything in our lives involves money in some way, shape, or form. And they fight because neither is coming equipped with the right language tools, let alone how to translate the other. And so a lot of my work around that has just become helping people understand the language of money, be able to think about it more critically, be able to ask the right questions, be able to talk with one another, be it at a family level or at a spouse level or a business part, partner level. And to me, if, if I can just do that in my life, I will have done society a wonderful good because when you can learn to understand sort of the language of money, that translates into just about every other aspect of our lives because it touches every aspect from how we earn it, spend it, save it, and give it away, it all usually involves some form of monetary aspect to it. Yeah, something that just popped up when you shared that, this idea that, you know, the mutual understanding, especially with like couples, let's say, or even business partners, or whoever's communicating about money, I often find that when I'm working with couples, if I'm mediating their relationship, or if I'm just talking to one of them, there's miscommunications because what one person is saying and what the other person is hearing are not the same thing. And so, for example, you know, I don't speak Russian. Let's say you did. If you start speaking Russian to me, I speak English. That's not going to work. 
but we assume that because we're both speaking English, we're going to understand. But the same word doesn't mean the same thing to different people. And so in the realm of money, I can imagine, and I have seen firsthand, as I know you have as well, how when we have this miscommunication, we don't see things the same way, but maybe we're living under the same roof and we're, it's shared money and we're, we're trying to spend it properly, invest it properly, save it properly, all that. If we're not speaking the same language, that gets really challenging. And absolutely. What's interesting is both might be true about what they're speaking. One of my favorite cartoons that works perfectly here has, if you just picture the number six turned on its side yep. and one character is on the top end of the six, the other is at the bottom. One is shouting six, the other is shouting nine at the other. Both are correct, but yet from their perspective, there's only one truth in the way that they see it. Yep. And so, yes, when we can learn just to better put that filter on our lives, to just know that what someone might be speaking, all right, I want to understand if that's true or not, but I also want to understand if that's true from their perspective. And at least the, the phrase I've learned is to learn to dance to the music that people are playing because we're all in this mental and language and emotional dance that is different from everyone else. And so when I can get into your world, if I'm speaking with you, especially in a client situation where we are, talking about something where I have a much different disposition now with money than the next new person I may speak with, I have to get into their world first and really understand, well, what's the dance they have going on there? If I'm ever going to hope that I can help them re-engineer their money and their emotions to be performing around it in a way that they want to, it does no good for me to just reach into their world and yank them across the, you know, kicking and screaming into the future, as I say, I have to help them self-discover that and then shepherd them toward the place that they want to go in their own time. Yeah, something I have, that's so well said, something I have found in my own experience that if you can, you know, count on anything as it relates to like, you know, interpersonal communication, the things that people say and the things that people do, they make absolute sense from their perspective in the moment, given the thinking they have that looks real to them. And so like Andrew said, for you to show up and just say, here's why you're wrong, and this is why I'm right, that usually puts people on the defensive. They might feel like they're being attacked. It's not going to lead to some great communication. But like Andrew said, if you seek to understand first, how is this person seeing this experience? Because like the six and the nine cartoon you talked about, from their experience, or from their, um, not experience, from their uh, perspective, they're right and I might be wrong. So let me see how they're seeing it so I can better communicate with them. And that applies with money and that applies with everything. And so my understanding, Andrew, is that you have a few things that you'd love to share with us today. And the first one is the three common myths around money. And I'd love to hear, yeah, and I'm sure we all would, what those are. Yeah, it's funny. I just gave an entire hour long session on this yesterday. Um, so I'll just be brief about this because this does demand that uh, a much longer uh, conversation around it. But three myths that exist, at least in the investing space, is that stock picking, market timing, and track record investing, looking at past performance, can, are actually you know, scientifically proven ways to ma manage one's money. And that's how a lot of the industry is set up to talk about those kinds of things. And what we've learned is that the science points away from those things. So there's just a lot of, just an example, I, I would say, you know, talk with your own advisor about those things um, to get a be better, more in-depth perspective, because it certainly won't come across in a, in a short phrase like I just provided, but that there are a lot of myths out there that what's interesting about myths is until it's distinguished from the truth, it is the truth, right? The, the explorers of the world used to look out at the horizon and think that the world just ended. So they just didn't go out that way. Until science came in, you had wonderful people like Magellan that then used their scientific tools to explore further and realized that we live on a globe and that then that science replaced the myth and made, moved it from truth into myth. So there's just a lot of myths that are out there around money that most people just fall into. One, one of my favorites to, to tackle, especially with younger people, but it really goes at any age is the importance of rate of return versus rate of savings. And most people, when they observe the financial news media with all the TV shows that are out there, the magazines, blog posts, 
it's all talking about, you know, rate of return and what investment might do best next. And it's trying to make a prediction of the future in where to put your money to get the maximum rate of return. And what next to no one talks about, and yet what I spend a lot of time with my clients on is more their rate of savings. Because if I can take, and you know, it's easy for me to share this just yet, but if you're listening and you want me to prove this out to you one day, schedule some time with me and I'll happily show you the math here. But if you take, show, show me with your set of income and if you save like the average American saves, the average American saves less than 5% of their income. And so a couple of things happen. One, they have less money around to actually invest, but they also now need that money to work harder for them in order to be able to say retire one day or put their kids through college or other goals that might come up. So one, they need the rate of return a lot more. And at times, then they start taking on outsized risks and then maybe they're comfortable taking because now they are poor savers, they procrastinate. It's always easier to start your savings plan tomorrow or people will say things like, I'll start savings one, once I make six figures or once after the kids are born or once the kids are through school or it's always some date in the future. Yeah. And so people procrastinate and then they are just poor investors. The average investor trails you know, pick a stock market index, they trail them index often by a number of percentage points every year because they just, we, we don't know how to behave with all of these emotions. And so when I can show someone that if they are a great saver, even if they took a more conservative investment route, that they will likely have more money at retirement a few decades from now than someone who remains being a poor saver, spends most of their money, sort of just lives into what society generally wants, which is you to buy the next new thing, get the new uh, you know, TV subscription service that's out there for $12.99 a month and just keep adding those subscriptions in your world and just keep spending versus you know that person that saves poorly but is always talking about some cool win they might have had in some risky stock investment. Person A in this example usually ends up with a lot more money because they focused on what they could control, their rate of earning and spending to and therefore their rate of savings versus what they can't control, something like uh, the stock market and certain investments. And it's a fun lesson to share with someone early on to, after I present that to them and show them the math there and workshop it with them to say, well, in a way, what I just showed you is that you are far more important to this whole plan than I am. And I, I love saying that because it removes me and my ego out of it. Like, yes, do I think that my work provides a lot to people? Absolutely. But it's more in helping them realize the value that they bring to all of this. Because it's one thing to have goals. It's a whole other thing to have a real system to not only achieve those kinds of goals, but to stay in that goal state. I mean, what? We're in the end of April right now as we record this. And every time this year, you see the magazines come out, how to have the beach body. If that was true, if that was really effective, they would have had that same article from 1972 and put it out there once. And then no one would ever need it ever again, because then everyone would have gotten the beach body and then maintained the beach body and be healthy for the rest of their lives. We are terrible behavior. We eat the wrong things. We drink the wrong things. We do a lot of negative th things around our money. We constantly misbehave. Hence now going back into why I, I take more of a coaching approach in my work, but I see it more as my duty to not just help someone understand the academic aspects of money and savings and spending and, and your cash flow and insurances and investments, because it's one thing to, to have that investment properly. It's another thing to know how to be wealthy with that, to act as if you're already wealthy, to know how to maintain a diversified portfolio in up and down markets to have a disciplined system around your cash flow to make sure your assets and you are protected in case you get sick or injured or die or get into an accident and to have a real system in place so that even if you slightly mess up tomorrow, the system allows for some minor points of failure to keep you going and not only achieve then the, the, the goals you have around your money, but to just stay with that, keeping that bike pedaling the entire time. Yeah. When you use that, uh, like kind of the the metaphor, the image of you know the flat Earth that it, it's going to be the end of the world, it's going to like drop off, right? 
And so you said, you know, the myth until it's questioned and challenged is truth in the in the in people's minds. And so I'm imagining, you know, there's people looking at the you know, the water, the edge, the horizon, and no one ever goes there because you're gonna die, let's say. But somebody eventually goes, is that true? Like, how do we know? How about we go figure it out? Let's go see. And in that same way, for everyone listening, whether it's around your money or it's around any other area of your life, you might have the myth, I can't do that. I'm not good at that. Maybe it's I'm not good at saving money. I've never been much of a saver or, or whatever story you, you tell yourself that you make up about past performance. But I often tell people that the future does not have to equal the past if you're willing to change radically now because the future is created by what you do right now. So just remembering, question all the myths that you're believing, all the limitations, all the stories about what I can't do and what I'm not capable of and I'm not good with money and all these kind of things because you can start getting better. And that can always happen, but it can only happen right now. Yeah, and as, as Mark Twain once said, I believe it's Mark Twain, whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. Yeah, yeah. The, um, you also mentioned there's three biases around money that I'd love for you to share. Sure, you. I like putting things in three, so I limit it to three. There's, I think, 81 different biases out there. But I'll hit on a few that people just, just as you're listening to this, just be aware that these exist. And it's not about whether it's good or bad. It's just to know that these exist. And before I get into that, the, the reason that we look at biases is it's sort of the, at times the default position that's presented to us. It's sort of, as people will say, it's the, the water we're swimming in. And the one little parable I love is that two fish are swimming along in the water Chit chatting away, they pass by an elder fish and says, Morning, boys, how's the water? And then they're quiet. And then they swim on for a little while. And eventually, one says to the other, What the heck is water? So, with these biases, these is sort of what I call sort of the, the zeitgeist, the default position that we're just given. And we don't even know we're given it because it's just what everyone else seems to be doing. And the three that I'll just touch on today is, you know, one, you have what's called herding bias. So people herd together because there's safety in numbers. And that's sort of built into our amygdala. That worked really well when we were back in caveman days and everyone was running because tiger, run. And that, that worked because then all you didn't have to be faster than the tiger. As the saying goes, you just need to be faster than the guy next to you. <laughs> and But there was, there, there was safety in herding because then you are a larger creature in safety and numbers and all that good stuff. That can be terrible in an investment space when you're just doing what everyone else is doing it because everyone else is doing it. There might be very good reason to be running the other direction. It might be fire, or it might be that someone's filming something on the streets of New York, and now you ruin the shot because now you're running along with them and you weren't supposed to. So it's just, just to know that just because people are doing a thing and a lot of people are doing a thing, we tend to put an extra value on that. And that does not mean that, that we should be putting the value on that. So it's just to be able to recognize, okay, Am I valuing that thing more only because people, a lot of people that I know are doing it? And just because a lot of people are doing it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing for me to do. Mm. Then you have something called familiarity bias. We often tend to put more value in something that we are more familiar with. If we've heard it before, if we've seen it before, if we've used it before. So in the investing space, investors in the US, so most of my clients have a familiarity bias of investing in US-based companies. Companies like Google, Tesla, Amazon, GE. These are companies I've heard of. These are companies I've used. These are companies that everyone else seems to know or talk about. And so then likewise, they put additional value proposition on things that they're familiar with. And that has nothing to do with whether that company is going to produce an investment return for you or not. So just because something is familiar to you, be, just be cautious that, that that might be leading you astray. And what's interesting is this happens around the globe. So Japanese investors tend to be overweighted in Japanese stocks. French investors tend to be overweight in French stocks. So it's not a, oh, there's a bias toward the big companies in the US that everyone's familiar with. It's just that the average person just will put a lot more value in the things that they recognize or, or know of. And so, especially when it comes to the investing space, just be cautious of that bias and know 
that, okay, am I putting more value in this only because I've heard of it before? That can work really well with your friends, right? You're more familiar with your friends, so you put greater value to them. Wonderful. Maybe does not work as well when you're trying to construct a proper investment design. And then last is, and this is sort of a, 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 a thing that often goes unseen to the average investor, and it's something called selection bias. And selection bias occurs, in one example, in the mutual fund industry, where every year there are new mutual funds being offered, and every year there are mutual funds that are deleted. They're what, what we say would, are killed off. They're closed, closed out. So if you've ever received any kind of retirement statement from a previous job, you would see down a number of pages, you know, or you might get a notice that says, hey, we're replacing these funds in your plan with these funds. Well, what's normally, what's usually happening is some funds are just being deleted and either merged or replaced by other funds. Well, why do you think that a lot of the funds that are being disappeared, why do you think they're being disappeared? It's not because they're performing well. It's usually because they're performing poorly. And what's interesting is we then, as an investor, we're the data that's available on a lot of these publicly available websites like Morningstar and Yahoo Finance and whatnot, they're, the publicly available information is only with the funds that still exist. So then there's this natural selection bias that occurs in the market where people are only looking at the good data, the ones that have survived. I think since the existence of mutual funds back in 1921, 23, there has been, there's something like 33,000 funds now today, which is just kind of funny because there are more mutual funds than actual individual stocks. So that's just, that just is, is interesting. But there have been something like 37,000 funds killed off over that time. So there are more funds that have been killed off than even exist and are active that one could buy today. And it's like going, dating someone, breaking up with them and being able to go out to Instagram or Facebook, delete all the photos. And the moment you do, all of your friends forget that you were even in a relationship with that person. So it's just to be aware that the industry can sometimes you know, work, massage the, the data that's out there so that when you're trying to do your own research, just be aware that some of these biases are not, are just exist because of the nature of what is even available for you to look at and review, unless you're willing to shell out $25,000 a year to the Center for Research and Securities Pricing out of the University of Chicago. So if you're willing to pay for that data, great, you can start to analyze that. But most aren't even aware that things like, and there's, I think, 80 some odd other of these biases out there from both a, a pure investment side, but often just from these emotional and mental biases that we have. Mm. Yeah, the, the biases, <clears throat> I know I've, I've spent some time studying the cognitive biases. I'm not sure if we're talking about the same ones, but they're definitely fascinating. Uh, there's one that I, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with called uh, sunken cost. And you know, yep. yeah, yeah, this idea of, you know, I've already put so much into something and it's clearly not working, but I'd rather put more in with the hope that it will work than kind of cut my, my losses now. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of dig yourself deeper. Yeah. The way I frame that to clients is like, let's say they bought something and they bought it and it was a thousand and now it's only 500. And as a, the, the phrasing often goes with those Vegas type movies, well, once I get back to even, then I'll sell out because they, they'll, they picture themselves a failure if they recognize the loss. And the way I try to position it to people is say, all right, well, if you had $500 today, would you buy that thing that you own now? And if they say yes, then okay, maybe their gut is telling them that it's okay to hold on to it. But if they say no, then I say, well, why you by holding on to it every single day, you're making a decision to rebuy that. Just like in a good marriage or some of the best marriages I've heard, every day they're waking up and saying, Yes, I want to be married to this person. And they recommit to that relationship every single day of their lives. I think that's beautiful. Yeah, so similar too. with the setup that you have in your life, whether it be with your spirituality, with your friends, with your job, like if you were offered your job today at your salary, would you take it? If the answer is no, maybe start talking to some recruiters. Uh, but oftentimes people don't look at it through that fresh lens of just because that's where they're at now, would they re-choose it today? And if they do, great. Now be confident and pursue that. And if not, then maybe some changes are warranted.
Yeah, I think it's a powerful question, whether it be in a relationship, whether it be with finances, whether it be in any area of your life, if you're hiring or firing somebody, it's like, no, or especially firing, but it's like knowing what I know now, would I make this decision again? Would I hire that person again? Would I marry that person again? Would I make that investment again? And if the answer is no, it, it's amazing how it shifts, shifts things for you when you say, then why am I still doing it? Yeah. Yeah. And so I also, my understanding is there's three key distinctions around money that you'd like to share with us. Yeah. I mean, we've already touched on two of them. You know, the one is around opportunity and obstacle. So just when anything happens, be able to have the lens to recognize the, the obstacle that comes up and, and look for the opportunities that, that exist in spite of or because of it. Then you have the difference between systems and goals. And it's really key to more create a real system around your life, your health, your money, and have a system in a way that great, you can have goals. Goals are not a bad thing, but goals without a system will most likely only ever remain goals. Whereas goals with a system, you'll likely achieve those and then some. But within that, any good system, in my mind, really splits the activities into two types. And if it's a thing that you want to do more of, try to make the try to make it as frictionless as possible to continue doing those kinds of things. You'll often hear people that are really consistent about their workout and they'll do things like go to bed in their running clothes because in the morning and they'll put the shoes right by the bed. They want to make it as frictionless, as easy as possible to get their butt out the door and moving. And then similarly on the other side of it, add friction to areas of your life where you want to do something maybe not at all or just less of. So that might mean add some friction to, well, if I, I don't want to eat you know, all those cookies, well, then I'm allowed one spot in my pantry, one tiny little spot for a thing of cookies. I, I can't fit 10 boxes there. I can fit one. So then you're adding friction because every time you want more cookies, you're going to run out of them. You're going to have to go to the store and you can only buy one box. And so it's not to, to say that that's necessarily a bad thing to have a cookie every now and then, but to have a part of your system that says, no, I'm adding just enough friction so that it makes it a little bit more annoying to grab that box, grab that next cookie versus maybe grab some he healthy piece of, of fruit or some other healthy snack I can't think of at the moment. Um, and then the third is one we haven't touched on yet, but it's one of those overarching systems and if you will, but more uh, frameworks that I want all of my clients thinking into, which is to have their balance sheet set up, their cash flow set up, their emotions around money set up in such a way that they're only ever concerned with the money, never consumed by it. And if you're consumed by it and having to put your attention there at the expense of your God, your health, your relationships, your job, something's off, something's out of balance. Because, you know, for the listeners not being able to see us right now, to me, money when set up properly and you have a good system that has the right frictionlessness and right friction in place, you can keep it on the periphery instead of, you know, captaining that massive Titanic of a ship of life. Instead of looking all the time down at the choppy waters and constantly swinging the wheel back and forth as life shows up, if you can pick your head up, keep the choppy waters in your periphery, but now you can see the longer term horizon for, ahead of you. You can see the iceberg there. You can see the island you're heading toward there. And it might just take a tiny little tweak now in order to eventually get you moving in the direction you want to and away from the direction you do not want to. So for me, it's about setting up the things in your life that really matter to you and set it up so that you can every day be consumed by that. So I like being consumed in my day-to-day -day life with my relationship with God, with my relationship with my family, with my health and with my work and with all three things that I do. I never want to be consumed about money. I don't want to be affected because the market is up or down today or some company reported earnings in, or, you know, like recently, Elon Musk bought Twitter. Like, if that's affecting your life and your day to day ability to get sleep or to have you reach for some junk food or for an alcoholic drink or snap at a coworker or a family, just be able to recognize okay, maybe, maybe something's off here because something I should not care as much about, I'm finding myself caring and being consumed by. So, when you can set up things that 
are a part of your life, but you don't need, they're, they're not, they don't make or break you. Keep them on the periphery in a more concerned mode. And that allows you more time, talent, and treasure to be put towards the things that then truly matter to you. And then allow yourself to be filled up with, to be consumed by those things. Mm, that's fantastic. When you were talking about number two, about systems, you know, it got me thinking about some, something I share with clients is think about there's two aspects to it. There's macro vision and there's micro process. And when I think about macro vision, it's thinking about, well, what's the big picture? What's the vision? What's the goal? The, the, the five, 20, 50 years from now, whatever that is, what does that look like? And people will see it and they think about it and they go, wow, that's amazing. But if you don't have the micro process, meaning how do you win the day? What's the system in the day to day that will eventually get you there? If we don't do that, we get overwhelmed because it turns into, or we get discouraged or disheartened because it seems so far away, that macro vision. But if we have the system, what are you putting into place where every day, every week, every month, you're making meaningful progress? And if you just focus on winning the day and you're moving in the right direction, right for you, given where you want to be, it's incredible. You, you get there more often than not. But if you don't have that system, it's just a wish and that doesn't change your life. Yeah, I was just listening to an interview with Daniel Pink, who's one of my new favorite people to listen to. And he has a, and I love people who have little mantras, little things that they can do to remind themselves on how to behave. And he talks about his, his principle of J5M, J, the number five M, just five more. And especially when he's dealing with something that he doesn't want to do in the moment, like let's say he's writing a book and he's like, oh, I just don't want to write anymore today his system will click in to say just five more, either just five more pages or just five more minutes. And when he, or with a lot of us, just five more emails before I call it a day, just five more minutes preparing for that client presentation, especially if it's a thing that you're just exhausted from just five more minutes, five more pages, five more, whatever. And in so doing, you then give yourself the permission to stop after those five minutes and more often than not, find yourself extending that and getting through 10 emails or 10 pages. And it's just that little extra oomph when you just want to quit. And I just, I love little mental, I don't know if you even calling it a hack is the right way, but you know, these little, you know, mental hacks to just, as I joke, I become the chief reminding officer to my clients. At times we need to be our own chief reminding officers and re remind ourselves of the way we want to be at all times. And then sometimes it doesn't, like you said, need to be this big, massive thing all the time. We often hear that that is, you know, societally preferred to have these, as they call them, big, hairy, audacious goals. You know, wonderful. But what can I be doing right now and just do a little bit more? Can I take just five more steps? Can I jog for five more minutes? Can I, you know, go for five more blocks? And in so doing, just lightly push ourselves. And likewise, that in and of itself becomes a system where you start to be a little bit more productive day in and day out. Yeah, in a way, it's like a challenge to the self. You know, can I just do one more? <laughs> and it, it, it's like you get competitive with you. And, and in, in a loving way, it's like you, your voice inside can say as a challenge, like, I bet you can't do one more. <laughs> and then you go, I'll show you. <laughs> and then you go after it. And like you said, you might do three more. You might do five more. But you're typically going to go further than if you just stopped right then and there. Oh, and something yeah. that you shared that I often hear people a lot and is the comparison to everyone else. And, and as you just said, it's more about comparing yourself to yourself. Mm -hmm. Like if anything, am I a better person today than I was yesterday? Am I moving directionally towards my God, my health, my family, my job more than I, I was yesterday? And one of my favorite little sayings, and I just, I so appreciate this turn of phrase is don't should on yourself. Yeah. And most people will, oh, we should, and then fill in the blank. We should have more money. We should be able to do this for our kids. We should, we should, we should. And that is an often inherent. There's a different maybe kind of bias out there of comparing ourselves to everyone else in the keeping up with the Joneses or, you know, but without knowing what they're going through. Or you might be comparing yourself from a financial standpoint to a friend who may have inherited a lot of money. And maybe they can do certain things that you can do you know, and certain big spending habits only because they, you know, ha had some more money than you with no fault of your own and maybe no grace of their own. It was just, you know, some blind luck maybe. 
Uh, but we often have this difficulty in comparing ourselves to one another because that's often what's available. And when you have things like Instagram and TikTok and Facebook, the danger of those at times is in that we are often comparing everyone else's highlight reel to our entire movie because we know our entire movie. We see all the good and bad up in our head. And then when we're flip scrolling through Instagram and seeing a friend of ours on some trip, we're only seeing the positive moments. We're not seeing the moments that, you know, maybe they were dealing with some anxiety, depression, burnout, stress, or maybe that's why they're on vacation because they're dealing with some stuff. We're just seeing them smile in a cool beach somewhere. And so we're often comparing inappropriate things, not just because we're comparing it to someone else, but we're only comparing to a small snapshot of their life and applying it and comparing it to our entire self. And so, you know, once you can start to just, at least recognize when that pops up in your head to be able to sort of disappear that and shoot that off your shoulder. You, you tend to have a little bit of a leg up on, on your own self the next day. Yeah. That's one of the reasons why I think it's so useful to have metrics that you track, whether it be steps you're walking, the investments you're making, how much money you're making daily, weekly, monthly, what that looks like, you know, relationship, how many date nights are you having? Like whatever it is that you're tracking if you are tracking it consistently over time, then you can compare yourself to how you were a year ago, six months ago, and you can look back and say, wow, in the short term, here I am thinking I'm not really making much progress because I hit some plateau, but then I forgot where I was six months ago and I've made massive progress since then. And so if we can just compare ourselves to who we were yesterday and in the past, I think it's so much more um, valuable than trying to compare ourselves with others. I think comparing yourself with someone else is useful if it motivates you and inspires you. But the moment it turns into a tool or a vehicle to beat yourself up, then I think it's no longer useful. And at that point, it's destructive. And so I'd love to hear about your three mantras regarding money, Andrew. Sure. So in no particular order. So one I've learned is the principle of be, do, have. So in life, most of us actually operate and think it's the reverse that once I have fill in the blank, some success or some love from my father or something like that, then I'll start doing the things a successful person does. Then I'll start doing the things a loving son does and then ha be, then I'll be a loving son, then I'll be successful. And in life I've learned it's the exact opposite. You know, if you want to have wealth, you, you start with being wealthy. You just are it, you become a man or woman of your word. And I may have messed up yesterday, but I am wealthy. I am loving. And then from that space, then you act. So then you, from that being, you start doing. So if I just say, you know, I want to have a loving relationship with my, um, my relationship with my father is very good, but you first be it. Like, no, I am a loving son. Great. Well, what, what would a loving son do today? Well, maybe he'd send dad a funny, funny joke he saw. Maybe he'd call dad and say, hi, maybe next time he sees dad, instead of going for the handshake, he goes for the hug, you know, and then, well, guess what? If you start doing more of those things, guess what you tend to have a loving relationship with your father. If you are, are wealthy, not, my, not just maybe rich yet, rich is just a bunch of money. Wealth is a combination of the money and the right mindsets around it, that you're with certain things coming from a place of abundance with other things coming from a place of scarcity, but you know how each of those is serving you in that aspect because neither of those mindsets is good or bad. Then when you are just being wealthy, well, guess what? You start to do things that wealthy people do. What do wealthy people do? Well, they focus on the things they can control, the rate of savings versus rate of return. They talk more about wealth with other people who talk about wealth. Just like the healthiest people you know guess what? They tend to hang around healthy people and they tend to talk about health all the time with those people. It's like they have their, their friends at the gym. They have their, you know, nutritionist groups that they're talking about, you know, organic foods and whatnot. Well, wealthy people are, are getting trained in that language of money. They're getting familiar with it. They're better able to spot all of those things. And then guess what? They tend to have wealth knowing once more, that wealth is the combination of money and the right mindset. Because if you just have a bunch of money, but your mindsets are all out of whack, you just have a bunch of money and most likely you won't one day. And so for me, it's being able to know that to operate in life from that being first is, has, has been a huge game changer for me. Mm. Uh, 
The second one, yeah, we already talked about it. It's that rate of savings versus rate of return. And it's, it's sort of one, uh, a distinction, but it's just one of those mantras that with my clients, when I'm having these sort of calibration sessions with them, I, and I, that's a, just another languaging uh, turn of phrase, instead of having reviews with my clients, I more reframe that with them to have calibration sessions. So thinking in that recalibrate where the steering wheel is going, we're constantly talking about not just reviewing the past, because as you said earlier, how you acted yesterday has ne next to no bearing on what you, where you act from here on out. But if you're constantly recalibrating, you're keeping your head up focused forward of great. Yeah, we need to know where we were just that that helps inform some things, but we need to continuously recalibrate on where are we going from here. So it's that just that mantra of the the savings versus return aspects, just because also that means a lot more once you start uh, unfolding that. And one of my other favorites is, you know, and I, I talked a lot today about sort of the zeitgeist, the default positions that we're given in life. And sometimes those defaults are just the family we were born into or the school we went to or some of our life experiences. We're, we're, we're all given a default position. And one of my mantras is to live my life by design, not by default. So sometimes we get lucky and the default that we're given is a wonderful thing. But if it remains the default, you might not recognize it for what it provides you. And you might not be able to take advantage of all that that provides to you. Whereas for me, just like we talked about, you know, the, the, those married couples that re-choose their marriage every single day, they're living a life by design. No, they don't treat each other. Well, the default position is, well, we're married now and you have to stay married to me just no matter what I do. So I'm just going to let myself go and maybe be a little less healthy, a little less attentive, a little less loving. No, they are living their marriage by design. And that design is, you know, think of a single gear bike at the beach, what they call a cruiser bike. Those cruiser bikes, they're just one gear. So when you step onto it, it takes a little bit of extra effort to get going. But once you do, you might be passing by someone who's running a marathon and running at that, you know, marathon pace and running a three hour marathon, let's say, and you're on a cruiser bike going faster than them without much effort. It took you a lot of effort to maybe get that bike up and going, but it's just the continuous pedaling. So when I'm waking up every day and refreshing and living my life by design, then I know that I'm living a life with much more purpose to it. And likewise, tied into that being, I'm being someone who lives his life by design, not by default. So when a default position is sort of given to me, I can just sort of recognize that, okay, well, that's just the, the default that is given to everyone else. I've, and I teach myself and I teach my clients to ask two questions but really it's the same question with it, with a different flavor, which is, is this right for me? And is this right for me right now? And that's with everything in life. Like, is this, you know, different kind of diet? Is this right for me? All right. Yeah, maybe. Is it right for me right now? Well, maybe not because of whatever, some other medical thing I'm going on, or I'm just about to go on vacation. So I'm not going to start that right now, whatever it is. But now you're, you're in this clear yes, no decision making mode. And I find, you know, one of the biggest, uh, I don't even know if I would say sins out there, but just one of the biggest defaults we're given is we, most people live their life in sort of the land of maybe. We're taught when we're five years old that no is a bad word. And to me, it's not. Maybe is the worst possible word. And most people may be their own selves to death and to inaction and to anxiety Whereas if you can create a real system in your life, and this is what I do with people on the monetary aspects, just to have a decision framework so that you can make clear yes, no decisions. And I'll even tell them when they're first meeting me, including figuring out yes or no, whether you want to hire me. And it's okay if it's a no, but I've not done my job properly. If after our, our first few sessions, you're walking away while saying, I, I don't know, maybe it's either I'm presenting it in a clear cut way that you say, this is everything I want. Yes, let's move forward. Or it's not. And no, I'm going to move forward in another direction. But having a real system around that to just stay in this clear yes, no of, do, should I still be hanging out with these people? You know, what, what am I doing this weekend? What am, should I have that extra slice of pizza to be able to make clear yes, no, and commit and don't look back. And to me, that there's so much value 
in being able to do that. Cause once you can train yourself to do that, you can make those micro decisions during the day. Like, should I get my butt out of bed at five 30 in the morning and clear? Yes. No, not, I don't know, maybe. And then just decide and commit to it. And if it's no, okay, you're going back to sleep and dealing with that. But if it's a yes, but you then live in this life of clarity. Mm. Yeah. Not maybe in ourselves to death. I think that's a powerful point for everyone to be with. You know, I, I see that as well all the time. And, you know, when, when we can come from that clear yes, no, let me not be a mile away from my mic. <laughs> when we can come from a clear yes, no, and not fall into that trap of thinking that, like you said, no is rejection or no is disrespectful or no is whatever the story. What if no just means no? <laughs> and what if we say no and yes? Awesome. If it's no, there's other people. But the maybe just keeps you stuck. You mentioned about being wealthy. I am wealthy coming from that space. What have you found to be some of the main or three main characteristics of the wealthy? Yeah, so there's probably a lot more than these, but the, the ones that I've observed, one, they're very patient. Most people that, and I'm talking about people that have generated the wealth for themselves that did not, weren't born into it, didn't inherit it, or didn't necessarily get lucky by working at the right company at the right time, but you know, over time, they are very patient in knowing how that compound curve of growth works. That what you do in the first few years of it doesn't necessarily produce much of a result, but every year you start on the early side, you're getting five years on the tail end in that more of that hockey stick growth mode. So most wealthy people, when they're investing their money, when they are making to sit, they're making things with the long term in mind. And they're very patient about, all right, well, as some people will say, you know, if you're going to invest in something like the stock market, be okay holding that potentially for the next 10 years and like assume that the market is going to close down tomorrow and you can't trade on that for 10 years and take that more long term, very patient. As I often will say, the best plan around money is one that is often best baked, not microwaved. And most people try to microwave results in life. The fad diet, the procrastinated tail end financial plan where they're planning for their retirement in a real way when they're 55 and maybe have five to 10 years to go. And whereas wealthy people started early, had that cadence, had that system, said yes to the right things, said no to the right things, and were patient about that buildup, were patient about that, that investment playing all out, were very, just very patient in how things move in the world and knowing that there's going to be a lot of bumps and they're patient to know, yep, this too shall pass kind of approach. Then you have discipline. Within that patience, wealthy people have a system that they are disciplined with, that the system allows for some failure to be built in, right? Even the healthiest of people, like so I'm thinking someone like a David Goggins, who is that Marine that does the ultra marathons, even he, you know, will, says, I'll, I'll stare at his sneakers sometimes Monday uh, in the morning for 45 minutes before he puts them on and goes running. But he has a disciplined approach to that. And sometimes that discipline allows for some sort of by design failure. Some of the best people I've learned that have a real great discipline around their health the system was not about working out. It wasn't about the output. It was about the input. Did my system say, get me to the gym? Did my system get me in my sneakers out the door and walking around the block? Then I decide, am, am I feeling okay to run today or not? And if I am, I am already out. Now momentum takes over. And if I'm not, I'm going back home. And But they have a disciplined approach to that. And they aren't just doing things willy-nilly. And sort of then the third to me is just flexibility that they are, they're, they design their balance sheet, their cash flow, and their emotions that more or less they're unmessable with. And part of that unmessability as life shows up, as you know, a war happens or an election happens and markets do what they always do, which is be in some form of turmoil, that they are flexible and they allow themselves optionality in any given situation. And so what you'll find is wealthy people have a good balance of, they usually have a good savings rate. They usually have money diversified between risk-based assets like stocks and bonds and real estate and promise-based assets 
like cash, cash value, life insurance, uh, annuity, secu social security, things that provide some form of promise or guarantee. And for just an example, this isn't a client example, but a lot of wealthy people, for example, will keep a lot of money in something like cash or cash value life insurance because it's there. It's not designed for as interesting of a rate of return as maybe their investment portfolio, but in a down market when their portfolio might be down 20, 30, 40, 50%, if they need money to buy something, well, they can look at the assets that aren't down and get out of the behavior of selling low, which is when everyone knows you're supposed to buy low and sell high, not sell low. Or at times, sometimes you find the best opportunities to buy your dream home at your dream price when markets are down. And it wouldn't do you as well to sell one depleted asset to buy another depleted asset, instead to have some safe assets on the balance sheet to then buy that depleted asset, wait for your other depleted asset to recover, and then maybe sell out of that to replenish some, some cash stores. But that now this all now ties together where they're patient around that. They have the flexibility built in so that, you know, most people with their financial plan, sort of the one default position that we're given is that everything is just going to work out. Okay. We're all supermen and women that, well, I haven't gotten sick or injured yet. So I'm just assuming that's never going to happen. And you see all these retirement commercials with, you know, the, the two people walking the beach or in the, the two bathtubs looking at the sunset. And it's all these just pure golden years. And most people then plan a lot of times for their retirement with sort of what I call um, the, the, you know, these blinders on these, what I call uh, cognitive ignorance. They're actively ignoring. Yeah, but those bad, some of those bad things might happen. I might get sick. I might need more medication. I might need a hip replacement. And so wealthy people often tend to build flexibility into their plan so that as Mike Tyson said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Wealthy people have contingencies in place. So that great, if I'm healthy, my plan works out. If I'm unhealthy, I've got contingencies to my, my, for my plan to still work out. If taxes are lower in retirement, my plan works out. But if taxes are higher, hey, I have it set up so my plan can still work out. So they're in that sort of patient plan that's best baked, they're building up a complex, well-diversified type of balance sheet that under all of these kinds of circumstances that they have no control over, they will be able to be more reactive later on because they'll have multiple options when something adverse happens, either to their balance sheet, like some new tax law comes in or to their health because they get hit with a cancer scare or something like that. And wealthy people then have their money and their mind frame and mindset set up to be able to handle those things because they would have already not just thought through them and set themselves up for that, but then in the moment, they would have been subconsciously thinking that that was a probable outcome at some point. And then in the moment, they're better able to mentally and financially withstand them. Mm. There's so much gold in what you just said. And I hope people see that who you are is not a static thing. Meaning when Andrew says, for example, some of those qualities and characteristics of wealthy people, patience and flexibility and things like that, it's not, I am, or I am not those things. It's have I cultivated it? Am I choosing to be that? Am I choosing to get better at that? If you feel like you've got those things in spades, awesome. If you feel like you seem to be lacking in those areas, what if you chose day by day to make that a practice to improve gradually, but slowly but surely you get way better. It's like I'm getting that, that story you shared about the, uh, the elder fish and the, and the little fish, you know, the what's water. It's just like, oh, what's patience? Oh yeah, I thought that too when I was your age, but now like I've cultivated it. You know, so it's a big change. And so, Andrew, as we get close to wrapping up, who are your ideal clients, the people that you love working with? Yeah, so this goes right back into the, the sort of default that we're given. In my industry, you know, we're taught early on to talk about clients in terms of the, the money that they have. And you'll often hear a lot in my space say things like, I work with high net worth individuals. For one, I sort of call that out because I'll say, well, I don't care about high net worth. I'll work with a high gross worth person. If someone has $100 million in assets and $100 million in debts on those assets, that's an interesting client. I would like to meet that person. So I just sort of called bunk on that a bit. And, I, and in living my practice by design, I say, look, I, it always felt a little odd to me to define people 
by money, even in the work that I do working with people around money. And so I've reframed that over the years and reworded that to say, I don't have minimum levels of assets or income to work with me. I have minimum levels of curiosity, commitment, coachability, and communicativeness. If you are that kind of person, I will happily speak with you. I will happily help you get to that clear yes, no decision, including yes, no, of whether you want to work with me. And that's okay if not, because my, I see it as my job, not so much to convince anyone to do a thing, but to guide them and help give them that framework in life, all these things we've been discussing for the last hour, so that whether or not they decide yes or no, they're likely walking around telling everyone that they know that they should be meeting with me because what they're introducing is not some end result, is not some sales pitch. It's an access to a conversation to empower you to start making these kinds of clarifying yes, no decisions in your life. And that's not an offer many make. And that's an offer I will gladly, because if then you are choosing to work with me, we both would have vetted that out through multiple conversations. And then likely I have a lifelong client. And if not, that's okay. It might have, I either, I just might not be the right fit for what you're looking for, or like I said earlier, might not be the right timing for whatever you have going on in your life. And so for me, I so focus on the quality of the individual, not anything to do with their balance sheet. It's even when I hire, when I hire, when I'm in an interview with someone I might be taking on to my team, they ask if I've read their resume and without, without, uh, pa without pause, every time I say, nope, didn't even read your resume. Because to me, I don't care about what's put on a piece of paper. I care about how do you show up to the meeting? Did you show up on time? Do I get that we're going to work well together? Do you have the personality traits? Because I can't want things for other people. And it's exhausting in my work to want something that they don't. Whereas if I can then feed off of their energy and just make sure that they have the proper setup to get them really moving in the direction of life and just expand upon that. And for me to play some small role in that, you know, helps me live my life with purpose, helps me sleep really well at night, helps me to pop my head off the pillow at 530 in the morning after maybe some, some initial yoga and stretching, but to really pursue my day with fervor, with energy, because I don't have any clients who are humdrum or whose sole goal in life is money. They see money as a tool and are coachable toward that. And it makes my entire life's work so much more rewarding. Mm. So there is so much that you've shared you know, today. And my hope is that anyone who's listening to this, there's so many notes to be taken. Like I'd recommend you go back you know, over and over again and take advantage of everything Andrew has shared with us. Now, let's say there are people who are listening that are maybe you know, 17, 18, they're in their 20s. If you could go back knowing what you know now in the world of money, what would you share with a young person or you at that age that maybe you haven't already shared with us today? Probably not much different. Uh, it's just to start a system, knowing that you're going to fail with it because you'll learn things about it, but just, just to start. The, and it would be probably less about money, although everything is, tends to be tied to money. One of the things I learned early on in my work, because I was blessed to have lucked into that leadership development program at Citigroup, where we were rotated around, it is the single greatest piece of advice I would give to any young person, either in figuring out what they want to major in or figuring out what they want to do with the rest of their life as they get into the professional world, which is to not spend your first few semesters or don't spend the first five to 10 years of your working life trying to figure out what you want to do with the rest of your life. That's what the society will tend to pull you toward. I would challenge all of you to think more of what don't I want to do with the rest of my life? Because if you take that mantle on, now you'll be all the more curious of, is this not it? Is this not it? Is this not it? So that when it shows up, you can better recognize it. It's just how a lot of people who've had success in the dating world, they don't date from a, let me just find the one. They're like, let me, let me find a lot of not the ones. Because then when the one shows up, I can better recognize her because I've dated a lot, a lot of other people and vetted out what I like and what I don't like. So that when she comes up with her wonderfulness and her flaws, I can recognize that's the one. 
And so for me, when it comes to your pursuits in life, one, don't pursue money. Uh, in this realm of sports, I've heard the phrase, don't chase money, chase management. So think of yourself like a, a ball player. The ball players that tend to fail in their sport are the ones that just chase the big contract, even if that means they're on a team that doesn't fit their skill set. Whereas the ones that often end up making more money because they have a lot of success, win championships, get other uh, sponsorship deals are the ones that chase management. They chase the good owner, the good coach, the good teammates, because those good people will pull more out of them than they could have on their own. So as if you're a young listener and you're getting into putting that anxiety on yourself of choosing a major and choosing a career, focus more on what you don't want to do, but also know that no one else puts those burdens on you. Well, I'll often hear people say things like, well, you know, mom stresses me out or, and no, she doesn't. And they'll challenge me and say, yes, she does. You don't know what she said to me. And I said, well, what'd she say to you? And they'll tell me. And I said, okay, that doesn't mean anything. It's like, yeah, well, you're not her son. It's like, no, moms say things. People that love us say things. Teachers say things. People that dislike us say things. It's all about what we do with that to internalize it. Mm -hmm. And I heard someone say this interestingly a couple of weeks ago. If someone was calling me all kinds of degrading names in a foreign language that I cannot speak, I might just look at them and say, well, that's interesting. It means nothing to me. But the moment they say that in English, now all of a sudden I may take offense or feel bad about myself. And once I've learned that aspect that no one makes me feel away, people say and do things, I now make myself feel away about that, good, bad, or indifferent knowing that I have full control over that has helped me to master my day-to-day -day life in, because let's face it, especially in this kind of work, people have all kinds of thoughts and feelings and emotions around money. And so they say things. And my old self used to sort of get yanked into a more argumentative conversation with them. Usually from a place of love, I wanted them to think differently, but now, and I'll, I'll leave the, the, the this conversation with, with one sort of, Say, say a phrase and question, which is the one thing I've learned with people, especially when I'm getting to know them, is got it. What else? And I say got it because someone's going to share something. And if they have a what I might frame as a cockamamie way of thinking about food or politics or religion or money, got it. I've received the information you just shared with me. And me saying it out loud forces me to just receive it not internalize it, not make it mean anything other than they shared some information with me. Got it. And instead of challenging them, and especially us New Yorkers, I've become a New Yorker, we often want to you know, have that witty, spicy comeback. I'll just keep asking, what else? And one I've learned, especially if you're wanting to get into some kind of work like this, I keep asking what else until the cup runneth dry. So sometimes with a, an initial meeting with a client, I'll ask what else 15 times. And then sometimes they'll say, yeah, that's about it. And I say, got it. Anything else? And then they might continue on for another 15 <laughs> or 20 minutes. But it's amazing to me when you can come from a place of listening and, and seeking to understand first, that skill set works, especially for two, your younger listeners, where they might get into a job of being asked to do it. Great. Got it. What else? And now they're just in the space of trying to just be in the, let me receive information and then figure out how I want to be acting with it rather than in this constant reactive stressful mode that then often leads you to just spinning your own wheels into nowhere. Yeah. So for anyone who would love to reach out to you, Andrew, what's the best way to connect with you? So I'm sure you'll put the, the link to my LinkedIn in the, the, the chat notes. Um, but I'm, I'm not abashed to sharing my email address. It's Andrew underscore Romano at strategies for wealth, all spelled out.com. Perfect. Yeah. I'll have the link to, to connect in all the ways in the show notes for everyone listening. If you enjoyed our conversation, I encourage you to leave a review, whether it's Apple or wherever else you can do that. It does really help and subscribe to get updated when new episodes come out. Andrew, as we wrap up, anything you'd like to say before we close? No, I think we, we're, we're complete with this conversation. This is one of my favorite conversations I've had this week. So it's Friday afternoon. You're my last conversation of the week. I think we'll just end it here. Perfect. Again, thank you so much. Um, for everyone listening, as I said in the beginning, my life's work is to help leaders, champions, and high performers create an extraordinary life without regret, to really experience the happiness, the peace, the fulfillment that they want most. 
And if I can support you further, I'd love to have a conversation and see if or how I can help. You can connect with me at jamilsayage.com. And if you're looking for additional podcasts, other pieces of content that I put out over the years, you can find me at Dr. Jamil Sayaj on Instagram. It's DR and then my name or Facebook or LinkedIn. It's just Jamil Sayaj. I'll also have the links in the show notes in addition to everything Andrew said. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your presence, your attention. It's the greatest assets that you have that you can share with us. And Andrew, again, thank you so much for taking the time, sharing your expertise and sharing with us, you know, a little bit more about who you are. And so most people's favorite day to change their life is tomorrow. And that's why they stay stuck. But you can be different. For you, transformation can start today. Really be with our conversation today. Think about what you can pull from it. What actions you can take as a result. A great question I love to uh, pose to people. What would future you thank you for? Get clear on what that is. Go take some action on it and watch your life change before your very eyes. Create a meaningful day. Be well. Thank you for being with us today. If this conversation served you, it would mean a lot if you left a review and shared this with anyone who may benefit. An extraordinary life without regret is available to you now. Choose it. It's your time.